Okay, how's the world doing out there? Uh, this is the Artistic Talent Show, and I'm your favorite producer, Melvin Isaac. And I have an excellent, extraordinary artist uh, by the name of Jerry Barry. And uh, Jerry, tell us, uh, just give us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I, I'm a landscape painter. I'm a Guyanese from the Republic of Guyana in South America. And uh, I, um, I was also a teacher. I pursued a, a, a dual career. I was both a teacher and an artist. And uh, when I first came to Brooklyn, I, I, I really needed scenes to paint. I needed to keep up with my painting. And I could only have done that when I discovered um, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, where I live. And um, I got started there with the Prospect Park. Okay, well, the audience got a lot of questions here. And one of them is, what is a park series? Well, the park series is a collection of paintings that I've done over a number of years. Um, it, it started in Prospect Park, where, um, where I lived, in, in, in Brooklyn nearby. And um, eventually, I moved on to Central Park in Manhattan. I, I became so, so attracted to the parks, I decided to see what Central Park had to offer. When eventually I moved to Connecticut, I um, heard about the Elizabeth Park and I visited them and I, I eventually ended up doing four watercolors of the Elizabeth Park. And the, so what I did, this collection of paintings is a collection of all those um, paintings from the four parks um, series. There are 20 paintings in all. Um, a number of watercolors, and some are oils and some are mixed media. Uh, thank you, Jerry. But the uh, audience is very eager. We are very eager to know, uh, why do you paint? Well, painting comes natural to an artist, I know. Uh, we paint because we have to, but um, there is more to it than just just painting. Um, I have done painting over a number of years. I've done probably over a hundred um, paintings of scenes all over um, in Caribbean, Guyana, and here I'm doing Prospect Park. But there is a point where you begin to ask yourself that very question, and that gets very difficult sometimes. Why do you paint? Well, it would have been difficult um, in the early, in your early stages of your painting career when you were just learning how to paint when you were sketching and going around doing things. Well, I paint because I have an image. Um, I have something to do. That's the what stage where you're painting what. Then you get into the experimental stage where you start to do the how. How do you achieve this and how do you achieve that? And so for that, um, you do a lot of experiments because you're trying to prove something. But the why part is what makes it meaningful. When you begin to ask yourself, now, why am I doing all of this? Why am I going through all this stress to experiment with this paint and this technique and so on and so on? It is because you are, you are arriving at the point of the maturity of your, of your, um, of your career. Um, it comes with maturity, I suspect, that when you reach a certain point, you, you always ask, well, why am I really doing this? Well, 
I think um, uh, you, you paint because when you reach that stage where you begin to ask yourself that question is because you have discovered something more meaningful in your work. In other words, you have, you have discovered what painting is all about. It's not just a matter of capturing scenes, and, and, but what are you trying to state, what are you trying to say when you are painting? So what do you look for in the scenery you paint? Well, sometimes it's not what you are uh, looking for, but, um, um, but rather what you stumble upon. A scene, you, when, you, when you are an artist, I suspect, you have a different kind of eye looking at things. You look at things a special way. Um, I have always had um, been questioned by people. They say, what do you see in that to, to stop and spend all that time sketching and drawing it? When I show them what I see in it through the sketch, then they come to realize that. Um, yes, sometimes the, the, the beauty of nature can just hit you suddenly. Um, you may just be passing, and then you see the drama of light as it, as it, as it envelops a space. Um, I'm not talking just about the ordinary sunset, which is obvious. You, you see a sunset, you, you are just hooked by it, or a sunrise. But even in the ordinary scenery, in the ordinary times of day, you can see the drama of light interweaving itself within a scene. And an artist cannot um, not notice it. Uh, so sometimes the scene captures you and you must respond. You must respond to what, it, and that is what you try to bring to the viewer, um, to the viewers. You try to share that, that ecstasy that you have experienced from that scene in your painting. Now, uh, there's a few more questions. How do you select a scene? Well, I, as I said before, sometimes you don't select the scene. Sometimes, uh, to put it a little uh, strangely, the scene selects you because you may just be passing, browsing, and there in front of you is a, a dramatic um, scenery. Um, maybe later on, when we start to talk more about the paintings, uh, you will see why, um, uh, why um, that, how that happened and why. But the scene itself may, may um, have certain qualities and certain features that appeals to you, appeals to your artistic um, tendencies. And you must obey, you must respond to it. Um, there are times you may see a scene and you make a quick sketch of it and then it is so dramatic and so dynamic, it grips you so much that you may want to use that very sketch as a template to do that scene on the different light settings. Um, that is what I did also uh, once in this um, collection I, I'm about to um, show you. Um, this one scene may be that beautiful or that, that dynamic that you can't help but go back to it, revisit it. Um, many of these paintings, I did them ag again and again. Um, I, I, these, these collections of paint, this collection of paintings, I actually reworked it 
again because after I have done it once, I noticed something more deeper in the painting and I went back to the painting and I actually upgraded the painting again and again until I got exactly what I wanted. So sometimes you grow with your painting and your painting grows with you. Well said. What is your perspective on the value of landscape painting? Well, you see, um, most, most people uh, I've talked to and who have talked to me, they see the decorative value of painting, in other words, as an object of decoration on their walls, matching their, their walls or matching their suite or oh, it reminds them of something. So they just want it as an object there. Um, I think painting should be viewed at another level. Painting, I think, um, should uh, appeal more to the inside and not necessarily only to the outside. Um, it is not valuable as a painting because it looks good here and it makes hair look good. It makes the wall look good or makes the sitting room look good or the bedroom or whatever look good. It, a painting should be actually appeal to, your, to your, your inner thoughts, your inner feelings. You should see a painting from within. It should have a conversation with you. Uh, when you look at a painting, it should take some of the stress of life off you and actually um, take you into another plane where you can actually um, like be a part of the painting. It's like a form of concentration or meditation. A painting, in, in my opinion, could be a center of concentration and meditation and not just an object of decoration. What about your studio techniques? For example, the watercolors. Oh, um, watercolors, one of my favorites. Um, I actually started to do real serious painting with watercolors. But you know, as I said before, um, you start doing, um, as you mature and you, you get more prolific in doing a certain technique, then you realize there is more to it than that. I did a lot of experiments. I started first with the conventional watercolor where I, um, where I, used the medium as a form of, of um, illustration. That is popular, the popularly how um, watercolor is used. People soak their brushes and they fill in the, the space for which they did the drawing and they call that a watercolor painting. Well, while doing that, and, and a lot of that, doing a lot of paintings, I stumbled upon a technique that is more effective, and that is let the paint itself do the um, illustration. Because watercolor is uh, color in water. The, the color should travel through water, and so you, sh you should keep that liquidity in the paint. Um, as, as it let the paint flow and create the image. And so in order to do that, I actually did my own little apparatus where I created a, 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 a surface, waterproof surface, where I can put the water and pour the water on it and actually did much of my illustrations in the water. Now, that was, that was 
I, I did several experiments and until I got it right. And with the conventional watercolor, it didn't do well because um, the conventional watercolor would, would, would just fade away. So I started to do my acrylics. I would dilute acrylic to a watercolor consistency. And I would do layers and layers and layers and layers. And I would work on it while the water is still there, just touching the surface of the paper. Now, I got so intrigued with that that I, I stuck and I did this entire collection of, of um, paintings for this series using the acrylic technique. Um, so I, I call it acrylic watercolor. Can you explain your impasto techniques? Oh, the, um, the impasto, the uh, impasto is uh, my palette knife. Basically, I use palette knife. Uh, the palette knife technique is, you know, people use a palette knife mostly for mixing their colors. Well, what I do, uh, what I discovered one day and by accident I, uh, I was trying to tell a friend how, pa how painting is so simple to do. You can do it with almost anything. And they didn't believe me and I, I took a palette knife and said, look, I'm going to show you I'm going to do this painting with palette knife. And I took the palette knife and I started to paint with it. And I got hooked on that palette knife technique until today. Now, what is a palette knife technique? Uh, all you do, I, I work with three colors, red, yellow, and blue, the primaries, and white. And with this, those three colors, I can make any color, any color in the world. I model the paint, and I create the forms and everything, and I create the forms along with the color on the surface of the paint. Now, as you get more into it, it's not something I can actually explain because when I started doing it, I had to experiment a lot and I got into it and uh, it developed over the years. So the, my impasto technique, I, I stopped drawing with a brush. I stopped doing work with a brush. I started to do it basically with a palette knife. And until today, even though I've gone back to the brush and I'm done painting with the brush, I still sometimes I have to sneak in a bit of my palette knife, even when I do the brush. Okay, uh -huh. Jerry, we have one more final question that we'd like to uh, ask you. Tell us uh -huh. about the sculpture like painting. Oh, um, uh, I said before I have been a landscape painter and uh, basically a watercolorist and so on, but I also work in other media, like um, leather, I, I do wood carving. As a teacher, I taught almost any, anything and everything, sculpture, um, papier mache, and all kinds of things. So um, I stumbled upon this um, uh, technique I would call it my um, my relief combo technique, where in, as a sculptor, I, I love sculpture, ceramics, whatever, I, I love sculpture. As a matter of fact, I did a, a number of wood carvings too. I wanted to see what, instead of creating the two-dimensional illusion on the canvas with palette knife and watercolor, I want to see what it would look like if I raise some of the sub objects or images off the surface of the paper or the canvas, so surface of the canvas. And so I used papier mache and in some cases pumice. Um, pumice uh, um, is very relevant for when you are doing um, um, surfaces that are grainy, like stone, stones, uh, stony areas, and so on. And uh, the paper mache, when you want to raise it, and modeling paste, when I want to get the textures of trees and so on, or 
or, or, or you know, raised to the surface. So I use these three media, the, the papier mache, the modeling paste, and, and, the, uh, and the pumice. These three, you will, you will see them in the painting. Yes, I, 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 um, I even use the, the, the modeling paste to give ripples on water, create the illusion of ripples on water, as, as you will see. Okay, so we back from our break, and this is part two. So, Jerry, you want to uh, elaborate on the rest of your uh, artwork? Yeah, this, um, this painting here is a scene from Elizabeth Park in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I, at, at the time, I was doing both acrylic watercolor and conventional watercolor. I wanted to get a feel of drawing with the brush. So I was into the rhythm of drawing with a large Japanese brush, where you just draw um, freely with, with, with loaded brush of color. And so this one, uh, trees in the light, I call it. I actually did it, um, just a slight sketch, and I went straight into the painting of the paint. It was an adventure for me because um, the, the, the size of the painting, I've never painted that large, and I decided to take on these large watercolors. So this one, um, by the way, I still paint with just yellow, red, and blue, the primary colors, and, and um, that's it. The paper gave you the light. And um, I did a few scratching on the surface of the paper so that to, to get some of the bark um, textures and um, and a closer examination will show you um, some other techniques that went into getting the stones and so on and so on. Um, blues gave me my, my shade, my dark shade, and, but um, I really enjoyed this one. Um, this is not the only one. I did a few others in other, in other scenery, but this is the only one for Elizabeth Park. On one of my visits to Elizabeth Park, I, I came one early morning to see what light has to offer me in terms of scene. And I stumbled upon this scene here. It's a, it's a rock bridge, really, a pile of rocks and a bridge, and a, a kind of a low overpass. And um, I liked how the light was just penetrating the surface there. And so I decided to make that a study um, in watercolor, but this time in acrylic watercolor. I did my acrylic um, mixture, and I poured and I worked on it. Um, layer and layer, that this piece must have had about 75 layers of color. Because, you know, with acrylic, you have to keep working on it um, and keep it wet. So, I had to keep going and going and keep the paper wet as I worked on it. And um, the uh, stone, um, I, I came up with all kinds of ingenious ways of, of um, uh, getting the effects that I wanted. For example, I used uh, sandpaper and disturbed the surface of the paper by scratching the sandpaper very briefly on top of the um, stones, and that created a textural effect that looked really, really um, genuine. So all this time, as I worked, I was really um, experimenting. And, and there are layers and layers of color that brought up the light more dramatically. So this one is called the morning. That's why I call it the morning light. Uh, this one is uh, afternoon reflections. I like reflections. I, um, I'm always in love with two things, light 
and water. And if you enter Elizabeth Park, um, just na near to the cafeteria, you will encounter this scene. And uh, when the water is very still, it, it's irresistible to see what the reflections can look like. And the water just, it, it's like the upper surface is solid and it just, it just liquefies in the water in a kind of a mysterious uh, flow. Um, I wanted to capture that, but in watercolor. Now with acrylic, it was very challenging because I had to get the bricks looking uh, very solid and the trees looking solid. But eventually I, I achieved it. Uh, this is a study um, for, um, this gives you a feel of the layers of color as it, I'm trying to capture the light um, penetrating um, uh, the, the rays of the morning light penetrating uh, the trees. And um, so you can see the, the white of the paper there. Um, uh, as I, I did my layers, my reds, yellows, and blues, and I kept going my red, yellow, layer after layer. So I had a chance to decide where I wanted the light to really penetrate. Um, so you could see that. When you look at the finished piece, you will see, um, it's like uh, those of you who do photography, you know the longer you leave your um, paper in the uh, gelatin, the, the, the darker and stronger it gets, or if you do printmaking. But in this case, I apply layers and layers, and I keep going with layers and layers of color. Um, this is my Miracle Lake. I call it Miracle Lake, one of my fantasies. Um, uh, it looked like a real mysterious place. Um, and I wanted to recapture that mood of uh, mystery in the watercolor. Now this is the finished piece. Later on you will notice I um, introduced three ducks into it, um, just to give it a kind of um, um, drama, some life into it. So this is a this is a finished piece of um, Miracle Lake. Now the 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 Elizabeth Park pieces are thirty inches by forty inches. It's half the size of these pieces. I decided to upgrade and go to a larger. Um, watercolor paper, 500 pound arches, it's like 60 by 40, um, really massive. And to control that with, water with acrylic was quite a challenge. So I had to make my own um, little contraption with ply board on which to place the paper and uh, I would pour um, like two, three pints of water into the paper and it would be suspended. The paper would be suspended until it's well soaked. And then as uh, overnight I let the paper soak and then the painting begins. Now all this was done at one sitting, which meant that I had to do this a weekend because I was a regular teacher. Um, and I worked from Friday right through, um, I would not allow the paper to dry because it's acrylic. I had to keep moving and keep it flowing. And I wanted to do another version of Miracle Lake, but this time from another scene in Central Park. So I, uh, those areas that you see where the rays of light are going through, they were deliberately planned so that I can get the feel of the ray penetrating and um, through the, um, the image. Uh, you will notice that I have my ducks there um, doing their thing. Um, it was quite a challenge, but I wanted to get to see what I can achieve with that size of paper. 
60 by 40. And it was quite a task, but I loved it. This is another one, the Bow Bridge. Um, I, again, just red, yellow, and blue, and I worked that, I worked that color um, slowly and patiently. Um, when I look back at these, at these paintings, I remember the long hours trying to get the next layer in. Um, incidentally, the, the colors were not washed in throughout the entire paper. Um, I, you may notice you may notice a little um, certain areas where the color, uh, the red may be more dominant here and the yellow more dominant there and so on and so on. They were just splashed all over. I worked all over the paper. The only issue was to keep it wet, uh, the bow bridge. Uh, there was quite a task to, to keep up with the reflections, get the reflections going. Waterfall. This is Central Park Waterfall. Um, this time I wanted to get the feeling of movement um, in the water. And, uh, and, and yet, with the feeling of movement, I still wanted to have the reflections and the penetrating light in the background affecting the movement of the water as if it was um, real. I actually that's, an, that's Central Park. I actually went there, sat there, um, took several photographs um, from different views, and then I made a composite to get this. Uh, but that is the actual scene of the watercolor. But um, I just wanted, I would come at certain times to capture the right kind of light because I wanted to get the right kind, the right uh, reflection of light where it is supposed to be. And um, I thought that I captured it. And this one is called the willow tree. Um, uh, what I like about it, I, I like the willow tree in the corner here that, that um, and I wanted to do study with full brush printing. To get the willow tree there, I actually loaded the brush, and I would just do brush painting, printing, like uh, Chinese brush printing a, a technique like that, and I would layer it like that. And uh, in, this, in this surface here with the, um, the water, the reflection, the stillness of the water, the, the, the dripping of the willow tree, the leaves of the willow tree, and the background, I, I thought made a, uh, a good balance. Now, um, after I had done um, my uh, prospect park studies, I, I wanted to really begin to work on, on Central Park. So I got into my car and I drove and I parked very early in the morning. And I had not made 10 steps from my car and there on the sidewalk, in Central Park, the early morning sunlight was just coming down and I saw the, the, the sidewalk there. It attracted me. I decided I'm going to make my first study of Fifth Avenue, that particular area. And so um, here I am working out the mathematics because the... the um, that part of the sidewalk was made like of cobblestones, you know, in um, hexagonal shape. And uh, I had to really work out the, the mathematics of it. And here I am struggling with the mathematics <laughs> of, of getting it um, accurate. Um, 
And then I would take my palette knife and I would actually create the, co the, the cobblestones with the knife um, individually. And as I walk them down with a loaded palette knife, uh, shaping the stones, the shadows, the light and everything and so So it was quite, um, quite tedious and quite a, quite a task, but very fulfilling but as you see as you will see later on in the painting. Now this is a finished painting. Um, you could see the cobblestones, even, even the, the, the cobblestones against the sidewalk and um, on the, 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 the sidewalk itself. Um, they're all, they're all cobblestones. So I, um, I love the, the combination of, of, of that, um, the textural qualities of the trees and so on and so on against the smooth textures of the stone, the stone apartment buildings um, in the background. Uh, it, it felt so natural. Uh, walking into the picture. Now there is something I must say. Uh, I, when I say a scene, as I referred earlier, of a scene looking back at you, um, this is one of my experimental pieces in my Third Eye series. By Third Eye I mean you feel as if you can just walk into the picture. This is large. This is five feet by, by four feet. I wanted them to be large and dynamic to swallow my viewer into the scene, that my viewer must feel as though he's not looking at the scene, but he's in and a part of the scene. This is what I mean by, the, you will notice um, most of, all of my um, paintings, they have that feel that I want you to actually interact visually and not only visually, but you must, you must have this illusion that you are taking part in the scene physically. Okay. okay. Now this is 92nd Street. Um, <clears throat> I had come back to the Central Park to look for another interesting scene. Um, actually, I had seen one um, called the brook and I came back to get a, some details on the brook to work on that scene. When I stumbled upon this one I fell in love with it instantly and I sat there and I did the sketches, did studies of it and so on and I remember that day was very dramatic because I got lost because um, I got carried away looking, looking, and they didn't know where I was going, and they didn't know that the Central Park was that large and you could get lost in it. And I didn't know to find my way back. And I, I sat there at the, um, right there in the park, and I took out my lunch, and I had my, I was having my lunch, some sandwiches. When I saw one squirrel come up, and I I just offered him a piece of bread. And then I must have blinked my eye and I saw several squirrels standing there. I want to know, well, did this have my magic? So I threw them a few more. When I looked around, they were birds and no fewer than, like, it looked like a hundred squirrels were there. And I got scared. So what I did, I crushed all my bread and I, and I threw it in an opposite direction. And as the squirrels went for it, I took off up to 92nd Street. <laughs> um, that was one thrilling um, incident. But um, this is one of the smaller pieces. It's five feet like Fifth Avenue. It's five feet by four feet. And this one is done not only with palette knife, but it's palette knife and brush. I did some, the background skies and so on were done with brush 
the water was done with brush, and then the, um, to get some of the raised effects, I, I use my palette knife. I, I had walked in from 59th Street into the park this day. Um, as, as usual, um, every weekend I would come and, and uh, look for an interesting scene. Even while I'm working on one, I come and look for another one to do my layouts and so on. And um, as, I, as I was coming in, I saw this uh, building majestically rising from the landscape. <clears throat> I thought it, it looked so majestic, it looked so interesting. But it's not just the building. It's the vegetation around it that made it look so, um, and the light and all of that. And I decided I must have this one. And I didn't have to go far because there it was. I walked straight into it, the dairy house, I call it. And so this is a study uh, I'm trying to capture the, the, um, the stone surface in front of the dairy house. And you can see the palette knife work there as I try to make it realistic. Um, and the shadows, they were all worked in with a palette knife. Um, and uh, and uh, that, um, the building itself, the building itself, um, the contrast with the building, uh, the smooth surface of the building, the texture of the leaves I did with, with the knife, um, I captured the light on the leaves, um, what looked like a rubber plant, but it was very, very, very um, those large, imposing leaves, um, contrasted with the building in, in a way that I thought that captured my imagination. So I went ahead and I, I did that um, with those techniques. And so this is the dairy house. Um, the, you will notice the um, what I was talking about, the depth, the contrast with the shadows, and all of that, and that plant just about the middle there. Um, a, a closer examination of the detail would have given you a, a, a feel of. Um, of the texture, the heavy texture done strictly with the palette knife. Now this is a finished study of the dairy house. Um, I enjoyed taking loads of ochre yellow and just putting on those leaves. It was, it was, um, it was, fall and so the leaves were beginning to um, to fall and they were yellowing and I, I enjoyed I enjoyed working on them there um, I, I, I got the um, just getting the building to to emerge was my thing the way how I saw it like I said, I use my third eye technique. How the, how the scene captured me when I walked into me, I try to recapture that feeling, that feeling of the building just emerging out of, um, out of its environment and the texture and so on. I, I, I really did um, enjoy doing that. The yeah, the um, this is the study for the brook. I originally wanted to do this as a brush study, drawing strictly with the brush. And I actually achieved that, drawing with the brush. But now when I'm supposed to now come in with my, my wash of yellow, blues, and so on, and, and really complete it, I just got carried away. I wanted to see, feel that texture and so on. And so I went on and did palette knife. I just, I just textured it up with my loaded palette knife. 
and, um, and had achieved um, the, the effect that I wanted. And this is the finished um, study where I tried, even though I'm using the heavy palette knife to get the ripples of the paint and so on and so on, I still wanted to retain that liquidity. And so even the water splashing down was done with palette knife, everything done with palette knife. Um, I actually did over the entire scene with the palette knife. Uh, this is the first of my um, Prospect Park uh, series that I um, executed. And this is done in pasto with the palette knife. Brushed in first, and then I reworked it with the palette knife to get all the texture and the feel and the color and so on and so on. Um, uh, after I had after I finished this piece, I, I got carried away because I saw another view of the same scene um, that I liked just as much. And even though it's the same scene, I couldn't resist. I wanted to do it, but with a different technique, um, both brush and palette knife again. But that one would, would be saturated with the colors of sunset light, much yellow. This is the, also a sunset scene, but um, I wanted to see what that one would look like. Here is the bridge at sunset. The, this view of the same bridge, but you will notice uh, it's layered and layered and layered. Um, I, I, lots of glazing. I wanted to get the feel of the sun just penetrating and the reflection of the water and so on. Um, incidentally, this one is larger than the original bridge. This one is eight feet by four feet. Very, very large. My largest landscape to date at that stage. I had not gone to eight feet. But I just wanted to see if I can expand into a bigger landscape mural size and so on. The others were all six feet by four feet. Okay, I'm not sure if this is the one you want me to go through. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the this is the boathouse. I call it the boathouse. I um, I had come to to the bridge um, to do a study of the bridge and I looked across the lake and I saw this scene. I thought it would be dramatic to do, especially with the light um, penetrating the way it was. So I, um, I, I, challenged, I challenged. So this scene is early morning, sunrise, um, opposite the bridge that we just, we just looked at. Um, the reflections in the water retain the liquidity and so on and the light was my big challenge here um, but I finally achieved it. Um, this is my only study of Brit Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. Now this is the one that has that is uh, we're into another phase here where I did my um, my combo uh, my my relief combo, where I actually did married sculpture and painting. <laughs> I did two kinds, two different illusions into one. Um, the the posts, the posts here, all of these were done with pumice. Um, rays actually to look lifelike on the, on the canvas. The, the sidewalk um, was done with pumice to give the feeling of the, of the concrete there. Um, 
even work with palette knife to show the different tablets. But the the um, the vines running around it were done with with um, modeling paste. Even the leaves are raised 3D to give a feeling, uh, an illusion of an actual, an actual uh, place. So I wanted to really camouflage this idea of um, if you look at the landscape and it's virtually 3D, it could give you the illusion that the landscape is in your house. Um, at the time, I was really, um, I was really into this idea of of bringing the bringing nature into the house, bringing uh, the scene into your into your life, into your sitting room or whatever. So this 3D effect was intended to give that that texture of reality. Um, this is a, a close up a detail of one called the mall. Again, um, you see that statue there done in modeling paste, the, the platform done with pumice, and the trees in the background done with modeling paste. I wanted those trees to really be heavy so you can feel it. Um, for those of you who know the mall, who go there, the trees are very imposing, majestic. They, they, they form a, a corridor of columns, columns um, along the, uh, the mall. And um, I, I wanted to recreate that in the, in the image. So the idea of raising the, the, the trunks of the trees to look real and then put on the, the, um, the leaves with the palette knife so that they are solid. Um, the actual painting was was done um, was done in the, in the different media, and then reprimed so it looked like a sculpted image of the painting. Then the painting started, and so that's um, and here is the here is the mall, the complete version of the mall. Um, uh, I wanted to feel, uh, and, and you notice how I brought in the light because after the painting was done, I actually went over it specifically uh, on, on one session just to bring in the light. And so more paint was applied, more, more service, and helped out, of course, with the brush. The, um, the sidewalk there, pumice was used to give the textural feeling um, of, the, of, the, of the asphalt area. Um, this was one of my challenging and most satisfying works of Prospect Park. It's, um, it's the Prospect Park waterfall. Um, I I, um, I actually built those rocks, those or stones, or and um, with pumice mo modeling paste um, and paper mache, and uh, the, the the trees were done with modeling paste. The leaves were lifted with modeling paste. Even the bridge itself was done with modeling paste. Uh, and lifted off there. The ripples of the water were done first with modeling paste with the palette knife before I actually got down to painting. Now when the whole thing was done, roots and all were done, then the painting began. And, uh, and I was just playing with a, a double whammy with the illusion there, using both uh, the illusion of sculpture and the painting, 2D and 3D illusion, to create that effect of the, um, the, the water just rippling calmly coming towards you. Okay. Another one of my um, 
my 3D combo where I did my relief. The rocks, uh, the side of the um, lake um, were done with a pumice modeling paste. And um, the, the, the water weeds at uh, the foreground were raised with modeling, mod, um, modeling paste to lift um, in front of the um, painting. The water, of course, I got the ripples with, with the uh, palette knife and modeling paste, but the background painting was actually done with both palette knife and, um, and uh, uh, brush. The sky, of course, was done with brush. So I was just playing with the illusion of textures here and, uh, and color. This pond, you notice, this is, you could say, is a climax like the mall. The, the pond is really a climax of my 3D combo. You notice the rocks down here? The rocks, oh, those are, those were built with the, the, the tree, the tree was done with, poly and this bridge was done with modeling paste actually built to come off to appear to be solid on top of the air coming out. And then the water was done with brush. Uh, I played with the illusion of the water, the water reflections. And then when I was finished, I played with my background and I had a really great time bringing the painting to life. For those of you who are interested in, um, in, in, in contacting me, you can get me at my website at Bluesaki, that is B-L-U-E-S-A-C-K-I-E dot com, Bluesaki dot com. Or on my email, that would be um, B-L-U this time, B L U S A K I at S N E T dot net. So it's bluesaki dot com and B L U S A K I at S N E T dot net. That's my email. Thank you. Okay, so now, what if they want to check out your work that you was just talking about? Where would they go at? Well, they could. Um, at the website. They could go. The, you could you could go on my website and check it out. Um, are you talking about pieces? To well, pieces? you mentioned Central Park. You mentioned a prostate. You mentioned there was these different types of park. Right. So can they go to the parks that you mentioned that they can look at yeah. uh, some of the the stuff that you had oh, took yeah. pictures of and then you started painting that that's yes if you want if you want to verify the scenes you can actually go to the park and you will see these scenes and and it would be interesting if you uh, possibly could take um, your phone or so with you and make the comparison, see how an artist does a rendition of an actual scene that you, you look at. In other words, how an artist actually beautifies nature or, or, or recreates nature in a painting. Um, I, I would love if, um, if you could do that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, artists. Uh, scholar, professor, Jerry Barry, for being a host on the Artistic Talent Show. And uh, I'm very pleased of the uh, education that you had just uh, uh, given out to the public, and especially young artists. So I uh, thank you very much, and I uh, very hope to see you again on this show again for another uh, talk about or explanation about your work. Thank you very much. Thank you.